X. Welcome, welcome, and welcome, and happy Halloween, everybody. It's Thursday, or as we like to call it around here, Friday Eve. This is the Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand in the big chair once again today. More traffic snarls this morning. Crash on Spring Garden Road this morning. Others on the Cirque messing things up for the commute again. My goodness, goodness, it it seems like the commute is more of a test of patience these days than most, and it's not even winter yet. Maybe the time change this weekend will improve things, although losing that half hour of daylight or that hour of daylight on the drive home might just kick those problems down the road and we may see a messier commute home rather than a messier commute in. But you really know it's that time, and and I know there's a debate over whether or not the time change is a good thing. Uh, But I was driving in today, and and when I left home, and I think I left my my house around 5 after 7 or so, I, I remember... When I first started filling in for Todd, six or eight weeks ago, whatever it was, um, I would have to put my sunglasses on because the sun was up and it was bright. This morning it was dark and gloomy, very, very Halloween-ish, but uh, it's, it's, it's wild over that essentially short period of time how much those daylight hours change. Uh, and, uh, of course, we will get, uh, we will fall back. So we'll get that hour back this weekend. I know the time change messes with a lot of people and with businesses, but, um, I think I'd, I'd rather have the, the daylight and the drive in the morning than at night. Cause I'm a little more awake at night, maybe, or maybe I'm just tired all the time. I don't know. I do, I do a lot of things. A huge thanks this morning to Vanessa Vandenez, who is at the control board, keeping things orderly around here. Without Vanessa, I can tell you that this show just won't happen. Not enough credit to her. And I just wanted to say that this morning because she does fantastic work. I know there's at least one disappointed New York Yankees fan in Spryfield this morning. Yep, Todd's beloved Bronx Bombers lost last night, and the Los Angeles Dodgers have been crowned the World Series champs. Congrats to the Dodgers and to the Yankees, as much as it pains me to say so. It's a grind to get where they got. Like 162 regular season games, then playoff series after playoff series, and then the pressure of the final World Series games. I don't think that many were surprised by the Dodgers winning the pennant last night, but you have to win all the games, right? You can be the favorite going into any series. You still have to beat the opponent and win the games. Now, I read and heard a lot of commentaries earlier this week after Game 3 that the Dodgers were setting things up to win at home. I never believe that vernacular. I never believe that a team sits around in a dressing room, or in this case, in the dugout, and says, boys, ah, let's throw this one so that we can go home and win. There's just too many variables in sports. I think that uh, some in sports, uh, that the sports world, the commentators and such are just maybe trying to create a little extra drama. Uh, have you ever noticed the pundits or so-called insiders will say a bunch of stuff throughout the season and when they're wrong, they just kind of blow it off. Well, that's what I kind of thought. Well, anyway, just an observation from my perspective. I mentioned it's Halloween. Trick-or-treaters heading out tonight trying to fill up those bags with goodies. Now, I remember as a kid, count down to Halloween. Do you remember that? We used to have a Halloween party at school and then rush home and wolf down supper and then head out. Me and my crew, uh, my neighborhood crew, we all kind of grew up together. We're obsessive about Halloween. There was there was weeks of planning that went into this, right? Back home, uh, it's dark by five o'clock, which it kind of will be here. And our general rule of thumb was that eight o'clock was the deadline. That was the, the parent imposed deadline. So we would boogie down the long streets of my neighborhood on one side and then switch over and then come up the other one, stopping off to dump off that first load so that we could go and get more. I'm not sure if that happens anymore. Vanessa probably better equipped to answer that question because she has children, but I can vividly remember those nights when, uh, when I was a kid, it was, uh, it was uh, almost, it was an obsession. It was, uh, it was the one time of year where I could, I could go out and just fill those bags full of candy and then, then munch on them for weeks and sometimes months after. Now the Mounties say the kids should be reminded about staying on the sidewalks tonight and look both ways on the street. We'll pass that along as well. Older children who might go out with an adult, uh, uh go, should be in a group. Police say also a good idea 
to only go to houses with the lights on and not to go inside anybody's houses or any vehicles for treats. Drivers also asked to be aware tonight to keep a close eye out for the kids and to slow down in places that you might not even think that people are trick-or-treating because you just never know these days. We want it to be a safe and happy Halloween for everyone. And uh, I, I'm a little disappointed this morning that uh, that my costume wasn't ready in time. So I, I've dressed up as as Dan Allstrand today. Um, it's, it's a tough costume to put together, but I managed to find some stuff in the closet to make it happen. And uh, I have yet to see any uh, Halloween treats around here today. Maybe we'll get Vanessa onto that one. Can you believe it's October already? Holy smokes. November's tomorrow. And there's a lot happening that month. U.S. election goes Tuesday nights. Remember, we'll be doing a special broadcast Tuesday and into Wednesday morning to bring you the very latest. 9 o'clock, we're going to sync up with our national team to bring you all the results all night long. So keep your radio locked right here at 95.7 News Radio and get up to the minute details and on an election that uh, promises to be a very interesting night, to say the least. Then on the 26th of November, Nova Scotians heading to the polls for a provincial election. We'll continue to focus on that election, bringing the party leaders to you here on the show and, the, and all the run-up to the vote. Still working to get Liberal Leader Zach Churchill into the studio for a full hour to answer your questions like we did yesterday with NDP leader Claudia Chender, the Premier of the week previous. And also, don't forget about the Halifax Mooseheads. We're the home of the moose and uh, returning to the friendly confines of Scotiabank Centre this weekend. In fact, the herd will play host to the Ruan Noranda Huskies on Friday night. And... Uh, Vanessa just happens to have a pair of tickets for that contest in her Halloween bag right now. So let's start the trick-or-treating early. Caller number nine, you can pick up a pair of tickets for tomorrow night's game at Scotiabank Centre. Good luck. Enjoy the game. We're going to stop and take our first break to get uh, that business taken care of. And when we come back, Duncan Ferguson's here from the CFIB. Business thefts on the rise across Atlantic Canada. We'll dig into that story. You're listening to The Todd Vino Show. Happy Halloween. I'm Dan Olstrand. Welcome back to the Tavino Show, and our congratulations to Chester McKenzie, who was the successful caller, and uh, will be spending tomorrow night inside the Scotiabank Center. The Halifax Mooseheads had a tough go in Quebec uh, over the last week on their first big Quebec road swing. I think, don't think they won. They were 0-3, and uh, uh, some changes uh, needed, to, uh, uh, maybe a change of scenery needed to, to change their fortune, so to speak, and I know Chester will be joining the the, the thousands of, of uh, Moose fans that are heading down to the, the Scotiabank Centre uh, tomorrow night. And, uh, of course, if you are an, a, unable to go to the game, you can listen to it right here. Gareth McDonald will be there. He'll do his pregame show, of course, as always, at 6.30 tomorrow. And then uh, we'll bring you all of the action live from the ice. So keep your radio and your streams Locked right here on 95.7 News Radio for Moose Hockey all season long. We've been talking about for weeks now uh, about theft. And we've been talking to business owners and we've been talking to uh, customers who have, have seen it. Uh, we've, we've heard some stories uh, uh, from uh, places like Spring Garden Road. Uh, business owners there say, you know, they're seeing people come into their stores and, and are very brazen. Uh, kind of looking at them and laughing and taking their stuff and leaving. And this is not a trend that's just happening here in Halifax, at least according to some new data that uh, was shared last week by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. A new report shows that the share of Atlantic Canadian small businesses directly affected by crime and safety issues has doubled in the last year, jumping from nearly a quarter, about 23% in 2023, to 48% in 2024. Things like waste and litter, vandalism and theft are the most common types of crime Atlantic Canadian small businesses experience. In the last three years, businesses have had to do things like increase their uh, crime-related expenses, like replacing stolen inventory or equipment or fix vandalism. We see the graffiti, we see the broken windows. Crime and safety issues also take an emotional toll on small businesses with two-thirds, 67%, worrying about their personal safety and that of their staff and customers. Very pleased to welcome back into our program, a friend of the program from CFIB, Duncan Ferguson. Duncan, how are you? Good. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me again. 
we've uh, th- I don't think this really will surprise many uh, although the the increase is probably the eye catcher here we know that that we've been seeing and we've been hearing from business owners on this program and many others uh, about the increase in 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 crime uh, across the city and now we've got more data that shows this is happening not only in Halifax it's happening across Nova Scotia and in fact across Atlantic Canada uh I guess the, the, the sort of broad question to start things is, is what are your members telling you about this, Duncan? Is, is this becoming a, a bigger worry? Is this on top of all the other worries that, that business owners have to deal with? Is this, is this becoming something that they have to pay the most attention to? Well, it's definitely something that's weighing on them for sure. Um, we're seeing the emotional toll, like you cited. There's a, a large amount of small businesses, two-thirds, who are, are currently being um, uh, concerned about their own personal safety, but also the safety of their customers and staff. So when you're operating a business, that's definitely a concern. I know I was down Spring Garden, I think it was last year, and I just saw someone run across the street with a whole handful of clothes from, from a, a small business, which, again, is concerning. So it, it has an impact there. And like you cited, there's the financial toll, having to um, you know replace stolen inventory, um, repairs as well, um, as well as you know, investing in some preventative measures. So you know, there's that financial toll, but also the emotional toll that's weighing on many small businesses in Atlantic Canada right now. I think the feeling out there is that, and you know, shoplifting has been a thing since there's been stores. Uh, that it's it's a victimless crime, right? It, it's it's like, well, whatever, you know, they have insurance or or whatever. I'm just, you know, I, this isn't going to break them. I'm going to only take one shirt or whatever, but. It's it, there. There is a victim attached to this. It's it's the small business owner, and when the small business business owner uh, sees these kind of in, increases in expenses to hire things like security guards and put plexiglass up and all that stuff, that gets passed on to me, right, as a consumer. Yeah, look, you know, currently small business owners are working on very thin margins, so when any increases come up to their bottom line, it often has to be passed on, unfortunately, because of that, those uh, the cost of doing business in general. Um, you touched on shoplifting. Here in Nova Scotia, we have the highest rate of shoplifting out of any province in Canada, which is concerning, particularly for a small business owner, who for some, you know, these, uh, you know, a couple instances of, of vandalism or theft could, you know, make or break some small businesses. So it's definitely a concern. There is that kind of um, victim to it, for sure, particularly <clears throat> when you think of who small business owners are, right? They're our neighbors, they're, um, you know, people in our community. They're not, you know, these big corporations based in Bay Street, right? So it's definitely a concern. And we really want to, again, put that kind of face to the, 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 the that what's, what's happening, the, the victim there. It's uh, small businesses and that impacts our communities and main streets. And, you know, we've, we've heard the stories on this program uh, about, uh, you know, like smaller businesses. I mentioned Spring Garden earlier, but also, you know, reasonably sized businesses and that's NSLC that, that have, have noticed uh, an increase in theft there too. So it's, it's not like the, uh, the, 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 those that are, are purveying these thefts are, are preying on small businesses. They're preying on everybody. And, you know, even if it is a large business, it still costs money. And, you know, that stat about 67% about, uh, people worrying about their personal safety of their staff, that's our neighbors, right? Yeah, I mean, it's all our community members. It's definitely a concern. We want, um, you know, main streets, downtowns, all like, all kind of towns, urban, rural, it uh, doesn't matter. We want them to be safe places to do business, and that's what we've been advocating through this report. Um, additionally, we've been advocating during the municipal elections. We're advocating during the provincial elections to make sure that governments understand that they have to step up. There is, again, that cost that small businesses pay, and concerningly, too, 58% of small businesses do not, um, you know, make insurance claims um, over these losses because they're afraid that's going to impact their, their, premium. their premiums, which already are impacting, you know, 66% of small businesses in Nova Scotia alone. Um, so there's that financial in, uh, impact, and we hope that there's some, you know, funding or programs that could come down the line or just working on those underlying issues that are really feeding into the, the increase in crime that we're seeing in our communities. The numbers that uh, were included in this report, Duncan, about half, just over half, 55% of, of people that, uh, that responded to this say that they consistently file police reports, but only about 30, percent of them are, are happy with the response they get. I guess the first question there is that 45% of the business owners don't. And is it because of the insurance issue? Yeah, well, of course there's insurance and there is, you know, understanding, you know, some consider, you know, oh, this is just a theft. It's not that big of a deal. But at the end of the day, they do want to kind of have some support there. They are taxpayers like any other taxpayer. They they expect good services in return for those tax um, dollars. And yeah, like you said, there's there's a, a big chunk who don't file reports. Um, and then the satisfaction isn't really there as well. 
Um, we're seeing, you know, particularly in rural areas, you know, many um, officers are, of course, spread out. We know that all too well in Atlantic Canada. And it, of course, is impacting their ability to respond to some of these instances. So again, this is a way where government can, you know, invest, um, provide some, you know, good resources to ensure that we're really getting good value for our money and, and these services are being provided effectively. And I really and truly hope that our friends down at uh, headquarters on Goddard Street at the RCMP headquarters that are listening today hear this stat because it's it's something I know that that they have uh, have heard from here and from business owners that uh, a lot of people, 70% of the people that actually file a report are unhappy with the response that they're getting. And, and I think that that leads to them not filing. Yeah, I mean that that could definitely be a reason. And again, you know, you know, full credit to the the you know uh, the age, uh, the uh, the the regional police. Um, they are stretched thin for sure. And um, we see during budget consultations that they're of course stretched thin. But again, when we look at small business owners who are on the ground in our communities, the cornerstones, they're not seeing the the investments that they would like. Um, and again, some organizations like um, business improvement districts are calling for more boots on the ground, which would be good to see more you know of a presence. Um, and again, focusing on um, partnering at all levels of government to provide, you know, the, the funding that's necessary to have good services, um, particularly around public service or public safety. How about the, 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 the impression of it? And, and the reason why I asked that is, you know, uh, I, I, yesterday I was, I, I walked back to the radio station from, uh, a thing I had to do in, in downtown and I walked down Gottagen street. I haven't, and it's my own bad. I haven't been down there for a long time, but there, there's, there's a lot of change that's happened on Gottagen street, but there's all these little inviting pubs and, and, and restaurants and, and, uh, nightclubs, the seahorse is there now. And, uh, when I walked by the seahorse there, there was a, a, a dressed marked security guard standing in front of that, not necessarily the most inviting way to, to welcome people. Is that a concern that, that you hear from your members is that, yeah, okay, we have to put a security guard, but it's scaring people away. Yeah, well, look, many have to kind of deal with it themselves, right? As a small business owner, they have to invest in these security guards. And if you consider the impact it has on a business, choosing between investing in a security guard or investing in, you know, uh, uh, someone to run the bar, you know, that impacts their productivity. So that's a concern. And of course, they want to be inviting. Um, but if you do um, face these realities that many small businesses have, they do have to put those investments in place to ensure that they are protecting their business. Um, some are putting, you know, bars on windows. Um, you have to, you know, ring a doorbell to get into a business. You know, that's not incredible be inviting, but it's what small businesses have to do um, to ensure the safety for not just themselves, but their staff, their customers, and ensuring that they're, um, you know, uh, not being you know, stolen from and theft and vandalism. It's important. Um, so again, if we see some investment and some support from all levels of government, hopefully we can kind of get this down, not just in, in terms of financial investment, but also dealing again with those underlying issues that are feeding into crime. It's definitely important to ensure that our downtowns, our, our urban areas, our suburban areas, our rural areas are inviting um, to customers. And tourism, right? Like yeah, I know that they got in street and, and Agricola, not necessarily, you know, a, a, a tourist destination for cruise ship passengers. It's a long walk, uh, but they do go and, and, you know, to, to, to walk down the street and, and be confronted by security guards at, at businesses that you're going to go to it certainly is a reputation issue too, right? That, that Halifax is, is maybe, is, uh, is maybe not the safest city in the world. Yeah. I, I wouldn't go too far on that, right? Uh, of course, we're not at the levels of, you know, Vancouver, Toronto that are getting these these uh, high levels of it. But again, it is there in our communities. And we just want to put a nice highlight on that to ensure that government understands that we're um, looking for some support there um, and ensuring that, you know, we are, again, making sure that Nova Scotia is a safe place to do business and welcoming to, to all customers. Now, it's not just a police issue. I think uh, some of the numbers that I flushed out of your report suggest that like 80% or 81% of people surveyed in this, in this study, business owners say that their, their tax dollars aren't being used effectively enough to, to improve things, right? We, we tend to be reactive instead of proactive. And that's when I, I got into that and 80% think that the government is failing to governments are being the municipal government, the federal government and the provincial government, not working together on the issues. Absolutely. You know, we don't want to see barriers like that come up. You know, we've seen, I think it was today, the um, health or the uh, Association of Business Improvement Districts in Nova Scotia called for a uh, coordination, you know, a poverty and homelessness summit. That's a way that you can get together, work on that issue and not, you know, it may, it may not be a lot of cost up front. It's just, you know, getting together and trying to work out an issue that's important and really bringing down these barriers to working, you know, inter jurisdictionally. Um, one way um, could be for the province to allow the municipality to create, um, you know, subsidies 
or rebates for small businesses who have to invest into these kind of um, preventative measures like a camera, increased lighting, bars for their windows, et cetera. Um, so that's one way that the, they can work together um, and would like to see all orders of government again come together and really um, improve um, the uh, realities that a lot of small businesses are facing around crime. You know what I find is that that we have a lot of really smart people that are in business, in in particularly in Halifax. I, I take calls and emails from them all the time, and they're they're plugged in. They they know their business. They they know their neighborhood, but they don't get consulted a lot on things like this. You know, maybe maybe part of that solution, part of the the summit is that you know you have a, a, a sit down with business owners in on Spring Garden Road or in downtown Halifax or on Agricola or on on Agonagen Street or Portland or wherever and, uh, and ask them what, what they want. Right. We, we don't often do that. No, I mean, you would assume that small business owners would be uh, consulted. That often isn't the case for some issues like this. Um, and again, we want, you know, governments to come out of their legislatures, come out of their, you know, office buildings and go on Main Street, talk to small businesses, consult them, work together. And there's so many organizations like the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, but also the business improvement districts, et cetera, that are there for that purpose. So we really, you know, want to be a tool to be used by by the government to ensure that our members' voices are being heard. Um, they are good on some instances, but again, we've heard from, you know, several, uh, you know, business uh, districts, uh, business improvement districts, that that's not the case. Um, things like uh, with the recent changes to um, the building codes for um, having uh, commercial properties on the ground floor, apparently they weren't consulted. That's a concern. So again, if you're going to introduce policies that impact the lives of small business owners, it's incredibly crucial to consult with them and talk to them to ensure that you know what's actually going to be the impact um, on these. And this businesses. is a perfect time. <laughs> exactly. It couldn't be even more than a better time, right? We're in the middle of a provincial election campaign. Last time you were here, we were kind of, well, well, is he going to do it or isn't he going to do it? But now he's done it and now we're there. So this would, this would be uh, the opportunity because they are out of the legislature. They are on the street. They are knocking on the doors to, to, to get, to get to the businesses and ask them like, how, how do we fix this? Absolutely. I mean, just like you yourself, we're trying to get in meetings with the party leaders and ensure that our members um, are, you know, getting the full information on, on what their plans for the future are and ensuring that small businesses aren't left in the rearview mirror and really encourage small business owners to get out, you know, meet your candidates on all parties, talk to them, discuss what their plans are and really ensure that we're putting MLAs in the legislature that have an understanding of small business concerns and have a plan to address them. Duncan, we know the campaign's underway. We're four or five days into it now. Uh, a flurry of announcements made uh, before and now during the campaign, the, the big ones, the tax cuts, the, the, the liberals suggesting a 2% cut in HST, the, uh, progressive conservatives suggesting a 1% cut in HST. We all hate taxes. Is that in your opinion and for your memberships, is, is that a, is that a good plan to, to reduce the HST? Well, we'd have to see on how it impacts demand and in- increase um, consumer consumption. Of course, a lot of you know HST are kind of passovers. They get a lot of small businesses get rebates for HST, etc. We want to see um, some movement on the small business tax rate. Currently, it's at two point. 5%. We want to see that brought down to 1% um, like it is in PEI and really ensure that we're encouraging small businesses to get started, but also ensuring that they have the um, financial room to catch up, keep up and ultimately get ahead. And the bridge tolls. We were, uh, were chatting about that, that everybody hates the bridge toll and the, the premier or the, the progressive conservative leader, Tim Houston, saying uh, that uh, nobody likes a tax on going to work. What's what's your thoughts uh, and what your, your, obviously it's new in the membership's thoughts on, on taking the, the tolls off the bridges? Yeah, of course, we would have to go to our members with that, but it, it's great to see um, you know as many um, avenues of getting into the city as possible, ensuring that um, we're encouraging people to get downtown. There aren't barriers in place, um, but again, we'd have to go back and see exactly how our members um, you know perceive that that plan. But look again, making sure that we've talked about you know tourism as well, ensuring that there's as many avenues to get um, local consumers into small business um, doors are incredibly important. Duncan, is always a pleasure, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's Duncan Ferguson from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business Crime. It, and I hear about it daily. I get uh, notes and emails from from people that listen to this show almost daily. And uh, we, uh, not Duncan Ferguson. Duncan Ferguson's a football player. Duncan Robertson. See, I, my mind is already gone. Anyway, apologies, Duncan, for that. Uh, Duncan Robertson from the CFIB. Anyway, uh, we get e- emails from... Um, from business owners and we get emails and calls from, from people that are impacted by crime and it's not victimless and, uh, you and I end up paying the bill on that. So I think that this is a perfect opportunity now that we have people out on the streets, knocking on doors for you as business owners, for you as consumers to, to ask your 
elected officials or those who are seeking office to say, hey, what's your thoughts on crime? It doesn't come up a lot, and I'm quite shocked about it. We have had both the, the, the uh, PC leader and the NDP leader on here, and crime didn't come up at all. And uh, I think that crime impacts everybody, and it's something that I think that has fallen off of the agenda because of all of the big-ticket issue, the issues, the, the homelessness and the affordability crisis. But I think that, that crime come, becomes part and parcel to the affordability crisis, and uh, I think we should keep uh, those that are seeking office their feet to the fire when it comes to crime. When we come back, come back, a call for more training for truck drivers in Nova Scotia, a conversation with the Atlantic Provinces Trucking Association Executive Director Chris McKee. When we come back, you're listening to The Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Alstrand. Back in minutes. Welcome back to the Todd Vino Show. I am Dan Allstrand in for Todd today as we roll through your Halloween Thursday with a gloomy, foggy sky. The The ambience couldn't be any better. I know your kids are excited because it's not minus 75 outside. In fact, you're going to see double digit temperatures for trick-or-treating tonight. And uh, our weather guy says it's probably going to be dry. So that's a good thing, right? Doesn't wash the makeup off. Anyway, those Halloween treats that uh, you're going to be uh, handing out tonight or your kids are going to be getting probably got here on the back of a truck. In fact, most consumers, if not all consumer goods, end up uh, on our store shelves because of uh, it being trucked in from some sort of area, some sort of form. And the Atlantic Provinces Trucking Association is now calling on the Nova Scotia government to uh, to commit to some new or to some increased, we'll call it, training for people entering the profession as truck drivers. We're very pleased to welcome to the program the Executive Director of the Atlantic Provinces Trucking Association. His name's Chris McKee, and he's on the phone with us. Chris, how are you? Hey, Dan. Good morning. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well, thanks. Let me Tell me a little bit about MELT training. What exactly is it? So MELT training is uh, something that came out of the Humboldt Broncos tragedy that we all uh, most likely recall in 2018. Um, The federal government mandated that provinces need to uh, implement a minimum mandatory entry-level training for new Class 1 entrants. So Class 1 being a commercial license to drive a tractor trailer, it's named different in uh, in different provinces. But for all intents and purposes, let's call it a Class 1 license. So our industry operates under a set of uh, safety standards called the National Safety Code. And as a result of this incident in 2018, the federal government uh, updated those standards to include National Safety Code Standard 16, which implemented a minimum curriculum uh, across the country for uh, new entrants to the industry. So in a lot of provinces, uh, you know, anyone that wanted to drive a transport truck could essentially go to service New Brunswick or service Nova Scotia and uh, challenge a class one, much like you would a class five license. There's, you know, as much as we have driver training schools uh, for, for learning how to drive a car, they're, they're, they're not mandatory, right? So what this, this would do would, would ensure that all uh, new entrants to our industry, this does not apply to people that have already, you know, have their class one license and have been driving for several years. This, this mandates that they must meet a minimum set of training standards before they can challenge that class one license. As I stand, understand it, Chris, that Nova Scotia is the only jurisdiction in, in Atlantic Canada, at least at this point, that doesn't have a, at least a date for this this uh, to come online. That is correct, Dan, and, and, and that's why we're concerned, because Nova Scotia is really lagging here. The rest of the country, every other province with the exception of Quebec, has now implemented this standard or an iteration of. So, so the standard sets out a minimum of 103.5 hours of training, That includes uh, in-classroom training, uh, practical training in the yard, so practicing backing, coupling, uncoupling trailers, and then, of course, course, a a road component of that. So, so, you know, some provinces, such as PEI, have opted to to offer a much more robust program at 220 hours. But I guess the fact of the matter is there is that minimum standard that that now is uh, implemented in each province, with the exception of Nova Scotia and Quebec. And and we'd really like to see Nova Scotia at least commit to a rollout date. 
you know, back in uh, late 2023, the province uh, held consultation sessions with the public, with industry, with training schools, and I must give them kudos. They were they were quite robust, and they really wanted to hear our input. So we, you know, we we came to the table with recommendations on how to make this program a success, and also looking at lessons learned in other provinces that already rolled this out to see where maybe there were some gaps and and where we can improve things. So um, with that said, the province uh, announced a, a an implementation date of April first. 2024. Uh, that was later, uh, uh, I guess, cancelled or, or postponed, uh, and we have yet to be given a new implementation date. So, uh, you know, now with a federal, or sorry, a provincial election call, we're, we're, we're very concerned that this uh, implementation may take much, much longer now uh, due to the, the fact that, you know, we're, we're in flux now in terms of who the, the new government may be and, and whether we're going to be dealing with the same folks in government. So so we really would like to see the government at least commit to a rollout date, whether that be January 1st next year or, or what have you. But our industry needs to prepare for this, right? Our, our carriers who are planning their talent acquisition uh, cha- uh, you know, channels and, and trying to get new entrants into the industry need to, to understand what it is they will have to commit to in terms of training. And, uh, of course, our training schools need time to prepare as well. Chris, I've uh, been reading stories for, for months, it seems, and even years, that there's a, 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 a lack of drivers. There's a driver shortage out there. Is that still the case? And if we add this training, is that going to maybe deter people from, from picking up truck driving as a career? So yes, you're very correct, Dan. There, there, there has historically been and still is a lack of drivers in in our industry. I think the the latest estimates put it at about twenty five thousand to thirty thousand positions uh, nationally. Um, this will not create any additional burden or hurdles to getting drivers in in, in behind the wheel of the trucks because uh, it's. I think it's important to say you know we, a lot of the drivers uh, or most of the drivers on the road right now are not driving down the road with with zero training. Uh, they, they just they're not in employable. What this does is this just puts a, a floor in uh, in terms of what's expected for training standards. Um, in Atlantic Canada, specifically in Nova Scotia, we have one of the highest uh, training programs or highest uh, you know training programs with that in terms of hours and and comprehensiveness in in the entire country it's a it's a 320 hour internship program with another 100 hours behind the wheel at a trucking company with a certified coach so this is the industry standard right now in uh, in Atlantic Canada and uh, we hope you know industry continues to adopt this so most of our members if not all of our members are already adhering to much stricter and much higher training standards the melt would would have them uh, uh, you know, have them adhere to. Uh, however, the, the the big problem we're seeing is is uh, with our training schools. So, so our schools in Nova Scotia who cannot offer a melt certified program because the government has yet to approve it are at a competitive disadvantage because uh, the melt the training is not recognized in other jurisdictions, right? Uh, that have melt that has to be melt certified. So, let's say a truck driver wants to move to New Brunswick or PEI or, or Ontario. There's no licensing or labor mobility there. Uh, They would have to basically go to that province, even though they have experience, they have been trained in Nova Scotia, and retake MELT training, just because Nova Scotia does not have that certification per se. That can be a massive disadvantage for somebody that wants to be mobile, particularly in a mobile trade like a truck driver. Absolutely, absolutely, and, it, and it's affecting our schools because you know they're they're losing business. Uh, a student, uh, let's say, a student in Amherst wants to to become a truck driver. Well, are they going to go to New Brunswick or are they going to go to Truro to take their training? Well, they're going to go to New Brunswick most naturally because that uh, New Brunswick is offering melt uh, certified training, so that grants them that greater mobility, right? Chris, so again, we just really are looking for the province to commit to a timeline here. You know, it's 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 been long enough. We have not heard uh, any. Um, you know, we've asked, uh, we've not been given any further information. So at this point, you know, we really feel that it's it's important to get this front and center and to make sure that government is is uh, knows that we're, we're 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 waiting for them to make a move here. Chris, uh, how long does it take somebody to to go from zero experience to being uh, uh, in a truck with this type of training? Well, with the melt training, again, let me let me really just be specific here that melt does not necessarily relate to employability. Like okay. I said. You know, melt is the the minimum 
But again, we, we recommend that carriers use uh, much more robust training programs. A lot of carriers use their own internal training, certified training programs with coaches and mentors because it's in the best interests of everybody, especially the trucking companies, to have the safest drivers on the road possible. Um, and a, for insurance reasons, you know, a, a driver with very minimum experience or no experience and very minimal training is not insurable. Um, so that's where these internship programs come in. They can help um, provide what would be the equivalent of, of, of experience, right? Um, so we're looking at about, um, you know, it could be months. You know, we, we, we look at, you know, um, th- the, the internship program, which is 320 hours alone at a school and then another 100 hours with a, with a carrier company behind the wheel with a coach. Only then when the coach decides that driver is ready to be on their own is when, uh, is when they're, you know, kind of, I want to say let loose, but is when they're, when they're given, the, given the wheel, so to speak. So um, melt, all melt does is just provide a bare, bare minimum. And, and, and so, again, it's, it's, it's not detrimental to the industry in throwing up barriers or more regulation. This is a, a federal uh, mandate, and this is something the province is obligated to implement. So we, we need them to, to, to move on this. Chris, I appreciate your time, sir. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure speaking with you. That is Chris McKee, the Executive Director of the Atlantic Provinces Trucking Association. We need to stop and take another break. When we come back, afterwards, Literary Festival right around the corner and a unique parade we'll tell you about. You're listening to The Tavino Show. I'm Dan Ulstrand. We're back in minutes. Thanks. Well, welcome back. We're rolling along here on a Halloween edition of the Tavino Show. Hope you're having a fantastic day as uh, we get closer and closer to trick-or-treating hour. I know I'm getting excited. Last time I went out to trick-or-treat, they told me I couldn't do it anymore. I guess it's, I, I act like a six-year-old, but I, I don't look like one, apparently. Anyway, uh, there's a literary festival that uh, is fantastic and fun, and it's about to take uh, flight as we turn the calendar tomorrow from... October to November, can't believe we're in November already, and that literary festival is called Afterwards, and we're very pleased to welcome into uh, the uh, the studio today, who's a very, 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 that's what I used to do when I used to write things, to, to get to the 200 words that I needed, uh, a very, very busy person, co-founder and co-executive director of the Afterwards Literary Festival, Stephanie Domet. Stephanie, how are you? <laughs> you know, I don't have time for all those varies. See? That's how I am. <laughs> there you go, right? And, and uh, as you can tell, I'm a, maybe a failed writer. Anyway, uh, tell me a little bit about Afterwards and what it is and, and what uh, what your, your thought process was behind creating it yeah. and what it's designed to do. I would love to tell you all of that. So Afterwards is Halifax's annual festival of books and writers and stories, a literary festival where for uh, this year, eight days in November, we bring writers and readers together. So we have about 55 writers that we are putting on stages um, and in workshop spaces around the city. And we're inviting readers of all ages to come out and enjoy hearing these writers talk about their work, read from their work, um, and in some cases teach you Uh, a little more about your own work. They might edit out some of your varies, for instance. Fair enough, right? Yeah. Um, So this is our sixth annual festival. Yeah, we started in 2019. Myself and uh, my friend Ryan Turner were both writers around town. And for about a decade, we complained to each other really regularly about the lack of a literary festival in Halifax. We really wanted to go to one, and there wasn't one. And after about a decade, we finally thought, oh, it's, it's us. We're supposed to do it. That's why there isn't one. It's our work to do. So we thought, let's just see if we can. And we could back in 2019. And then then there was, a you know, the global pandemic. So that made our second and third years a little more challenging. Right. Um, but we came out of that and uh, returned to in-person programming in 2022. Um, and now here we are celebrating our sixth annual festival at venues all around Halifax. Uh, some programming also in Dartmouth. We're in Cherry Brook this year as well at the Black Cultural Center, which we're really excited about. And, uh, and we're in, in Millbrook at the Millbrook uh, Cultural Center as well. So there's something in this that I'm looking at the program and yeah. it's, it's, it's rather thick and there's, there's yeah. a lot of events. There, there's something in here 
I know this is an overused cliche, but really for everyone, right? Absolutely for everyone. That is always our goal. Uh, We hope everyone will see themselves reflected somehow at afterwards or find something to spark their imagination or challenge their way of thinking. Um, A lot of times people will say, well, I can't come to a literary festival. I haven't read the books. And I think you're the perfect person to come to the literary festival because... (laughs) <laughs> the writers are going to do the reading for you. Like, right. Let them do the heavy lifting. It's easy. There you sit. They'll read to you. And then they'll talk a little about the what pushed them to the page. So, yeah. So we have programming for um, kids on Saturday at Central Library, a free free for all for kids ages like infants in arms to 12, where we're bringing together 12 authors and illustrators. The kids get a little passport. They go to each table and get a little sticker or stamp or autograph. It's extremely cute. There's cotton candy. Um, and you sold me on the cotton candy. Right? The library makes cotton candy. Like, we'll what can't a library do? Um, and that's a free event. It's an open house style thing from 1230 to 4. Come for 10 minutes uh, or stay for the whole afternoon. Last year, families did both. And it's really, really fun. Super cute. On Sunday, we have a lot of programming for um, older kids, 12 and up, um, including adults. It's YA, young adult, and so many adults are reading that um, genre now, too. So that's happening at the McPhee Center in Dartmouth on Sunday afternoon uh, with the amazing local writer B.R. Myers and Sidora Ludwig and a graphic novelist from Quebec named Geneviève Biguet, who we're really excited to meet. And then we're into like a full week of programming for mostly adults, I would say. Um, Every night we'll have something happening somewhere. And afternoons, too, uh, we're doing a a little pop-up with Poets Laureate, Halifax's Poets Laureate, past and present. Mm. Um, We made a little free library last year at uh, the corner of Carlton Street and Spring Garden Road, which we stuff with books. It's right next to the Halifax Community Fridge, so we also donate food there whenever we can. And uh, we're going to do a little afternoon poetry. Like uh, you can get your kind of daily recommended dose of poetry for free um, at the corner of Spring Garden and Carlton Street Monday through Thursday next week. These festivals are are a mammoth, mammoth (laughs) job to put on and don't happen without the hard work of you and your team and and I would imagine an army of volunteers. We have a number of volunteers. Yeah, Ryan. So our team is me and Ryan and two people named Emily. We have a web Emily and an office Emily. So if you want to work with us, you will have to change your name name to Emily. It just makes it a lot easier for us. Um, And then, yeah, we have like a cadre of volunteers and a a color-coded spreadsheet that is many miles long that, uh, that... details, kind of everyone who's going to help us lift this up. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Tell me a little bit about the Walking Trees Parade. That one's what caught my attention. Yeah, this is kind of the jewel in the crown. So we thought Kids Day was the cutest thing we'd ever produce. And then we got this idea to make this Walking Trees Tree Parade. So Marie-Louise Gay is probably one of Canada's most beloved children's authors. She's written, I don't know, I think yesterday I heard her say 70 books. Estella, Queen of Snow, like that Stella and Sam series were really popular. Her new book is called Walking Trees. She was inspired by an art project in the Netherlands where this artist made a project called Bosque, where he um, brought trees in these big wheeled pots into city squares that had no greenery and like enliven them and then they would move on. So Marie Louise was really inspired by that. And she wanted to then inspire kids to like understand or remember that they could change their corner of the world with ease, you know. So she writes a book about this kid who doesn't see any trees because she lives right downtown, goes to a forest for the first time, gets totally enchanted, gets a tree for her birthday, realizes this tree is missing out on everything, just living on the balcony in a pot. So she gets him in a wagon and takes him for a walk around town. And we thought it would be fun to do that. And then plant the trees somewhere. So um, we've invited donors and sponsors. And there's still space for two more donors, actually, um, before the event on Saturday. If you want to sponsor this event, get in touch with us. Um, But we have purchased, with the help of these sponsors, seven saplings, native species. And we have held a little lottery to choose families who are going to pull the wagons with these trees 
uh, in a tree parade up Spring Garden Road on Saturday morning to the public gardens where, with the help of Sean Street and uh, some workers at the public gardens, we're going to plant these trees along that, you know, the Grand Allee that runs from like Summer to South Park and it has that beautiful, well, all those trees are kind of the same age and same species, which is beautiful to look at, but not great for sustainability, right? And resilience. And we're all about those things that afterwards. So we're going to plant these um, these new, these seven native species, these little sweet little saplings along that Grand Allee. And uh, kids will be able to know for generations, you know, they'll be able I to planted visit that them. Tree. I planted that tree. I contributed to my community. So the families who are going to pull the wagons have been chosen, but everyone is invited to join our parade. It's free. It's happening at 1130. We're meeting at the back plaza um, behind the Central Library. So right outside Paulo Regan Hall. We're going to go a couple times around the plaza with the trees and wagons. And then Peter Dunker is going to lead us. He's the parade marshal. He's going to lead us up Spring Garden and over to the public gardens. Marie Louise Gay will be there. And then we'll all make our way back to Central Library for Kids Day. Right. Journée Jeunesse. I was just out picking up juice boxes and little bags of treats to accompany the cotton candy. And uh, and it'll be a really sweet, fun time. If somebody wants to take part in Afterwards, yeah. where's the best place for them to get all the information? Yeah, it's all on our website, courtesy of Web Emily. Um, info, nope, that's our email address. Our website is simply afterwardsliteraryfestival.com. And, and everything is there. there. The program, all the of the places, because there. there's can, a million different things going on here. Million, They're all over the place. There are things going on that aren't even in this little booklet. There you go. And we have lots of the events are free and as if, well. And if there are two sponsors available for that uh, parade, they, they can get info there. They should drop me an email. Yeah, they can find me on the website. I'm looking forward to it. Stephanie, I appreciate your time. Have a fantastic festival, and I'll try to get down there for at least one of the events. And uh, and who knows, maybe I'll get re-inspired. Maybe you will. It's going to be very, 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 <laughs> very inspiring. It's like, it's like I set that up or something. <laughs> Stephanie, I appreciate it. Stephanie Dolmet <laughs> is in the studio. Afterwards, Literary Festival is the event happening for a week long. There really is something in there for everybody. I know I say that a lot, but it's not just a dusty old, you know, reading of some old tomb that, uh, or tome of books. It's uh, There's a lot of really interesting stuff there, and it might be a way to inspire yourself or your kids, or maybe both. Need to stop down and take a break for the news. When we come back, we're going to throw open the telephone lines. It's time for the open hour. 902-405-6000 is the number. We're back after the break. Thanks. Oh, Vanessa's got the music out. It is Halloween. We're having a fantastic day. Telephone lines are now open. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. This is your chance to talk about uh, anything that you want to talk about. I am curious, however, if you are uh, going to be handing out treats tonight. It's, It's interesting. It used to be just a thing, right? Everybody did it. But I was having a conversation... Uh, around the the radio station here, not to say that we're all tightwads, but uh, some people just don't, and uh, some people can't because they, of where they live. I live in a building, so the building doesn't allow for uh, children to to wander the halls. They they do a thing out front and uh, ask uh, the tenants of the building if they would like to um, donate to the to the kitty sort of thing, um, but some people just don't. Because one or two or three, maybe more than three or four people said, you know, I used to, but holy smokes, it's expensive. And we had a conversation, I think it was last week with somebody who lived in the North End somewhere, uh, in, uh, around the Hydrostone, who said that they get over 300 kids a night. That's a lot, that's a lot of treats and they're not cheap. So... Not the only thing we can talk about today, but it might be something you might want to talk about. Do you give out treats? And for your parents out there that have kids that are of trick-or-treating age, do your kids go out? I think I mentioned off the top of the program, it used to be, we planned for weeks for this. We would, you know, it would be, uh, the the starting gun would go after supper and we would go until eight o'clock and go as, as quickly and as safely as we could down one street and up the other. Um, I live in a neighborhood full of buildings, so we don't see a lot of kids on, even on the sidewalk because they all get in their cars and they go to the neighborhoods with houses because they do better. 
That is smart. That, that's strategic thinking. That being said, I, I don't get a, a feel for uh, you know how many kids are out there. So we're hearing the schools are jammed. We're hearing that they're having to, uh, to increase the number of people in classes and add portables because there's so many children. Do your kids go out? Are you expecting a lot of kids tonight? And Vanessa wants to know what you're handing out. Chips or chocolate bars or something else. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Just some things that you can want to talk about. There's a lot going on out there. And we'll kick off the conversation this morning with John. John, how are you? Hello. Good morning, Dan. Very good. Thank you. What's on your mind? Uh, uh, ideally, I mean, um, it's the traffic situation in the city. Isn't it crazy? Uh, I feel it tremendous sympathy and concern for this young 23-year-old cyclist oh my goodness right who either had a door opened in front of him or it was open and he didn't see it i don't know yeah but uh you know this is two days in a row of ridiculous traffic situations first of all i'm a long time cyclist decades i've avoided many accidents because cyclists tend to be pretty careful for the most part kind of have to be right because your life is in your hands i I used to ride a motorcycle in halifax and i stopped because i was so worried about getting hit uh dan i just sold my 1981 uh Midnight Maxim 650 this oh, August. To, must uh, have broke your heart. I wanted it, and I it broke my heart to do it. But yeah. honestly, I have had too many scares because people are not paying attention uh, for all sorts of reasons. So I'll just I'll be brief. I know you get a lot of callers. Yeah. Um, just this whole idea of uh, enforcement of basic rules and regulations in our city. I don't remember really the last time I've seen any police presence to kind of inform people, pull them over, do whatever it is they have to do. Every day I'm on the road. I am retired now, four months ago, so I don't have to go to Halifax every day. I'm in Coal Harbor. Two of my sons travel from Halifax to Dartmouth every day to work. No choice. Um, when you are seeing backups, um, you know, which are kilometers long on a regular basis, our city is hurting. You're harming our reputation. You're making so many people upset and angry for all sorts of reasons. We need a strategy to do something about it. So when I see people getting away with bad behavior driving, looking in their lap at every red light, no signals, drifting through stop signs and red lights, or going right through them, and nothing seems to be concerning our city you know, representatives, and I'm going to put this on the Savage government because I think Andy's going to do something to change things when he, when he starts. Um, it's, it's scary. I don't let my wife drive because she doesn't really want to anyway. She is panicked to go out and try to do something. So I've got a couple solutions. Sure, quick. Perhaps, um, maybe if we could, for even a, a, an experiment, put the ferries on free for people who want to travel on them from, say, 6 in the morning till 9, and I was in that group going to work, or 4 to 6 at night, see what happens. Um, I like Tim Houston's idea about let's get rid of the tolls. Free is better than paying sitting in traffic. I still wouldn't take my car to Halifax, even if it's free that often, because where am I going to park? I'm going to pay through the nose through most places. It's the congestion. It's just not convenient. So and you're paying for gas. So try the ferry idea. Let's have some police informant, enforcement. Please give us some public education. I don't care if it's on local radio or news channels at all. For all the newcomers to our province, whether from within Canada or somewhere else, please do this when you're driving instead of this. Rules and regulations you need to follow, and I want to see them enforced because innocent people are getting hurt. It's, it's bad. It's, it's hurting our city. I feel so bad for this poor woman in the, in, in, in the valley, and I was just down there last week, who was rear-ended by a transport truck because of the work they're doing down there. In, you know, inadequate signage uh, and, and, and kilometer-long traffic jams. I barely avoided uh, that myself by detouring in through Grand Prix. But we, we have lots of people. We have lots of cars. Someone has to have a strategy to do something. Uh, this constant road work in our, in our daily lives, you've got to put it at night, and I think Andy Fillmore suggested that. Like, I'm seeing people speeding because they're so frustrated they can't take it anymore. Not that that's an excuse, but I'm seeing people going so slow because they don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're doing. They're waiting for someone to tell them. Anyway, Dan, I'll leave it with you. John, I appreciate it. Can't argue with your points. Okay, maybe some other people have some some, some strategies, but we got to do something. This is not working. Thanks, have, Dan. Have a great day, sir. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. It's, uh, it is, uh, it was an election issue during the municipal campaign. I think that pretty much every person that we spoke to uh, that was uh, offering for council 
uh, sat in that chair right across from me and and said the same thing that that's what they were hearing on their uh, on the doorstep when they were were heading out. It's uh, but the fix is isn't easy. I don't think it's uh, it's one of those. I don't. I like the ferry idea. I think that you know that's that's not say let's you know take it off. That's it. We're done. Like why not do a trial or do a pilot on it and and see if it impacts traffic. If it doesn't impact traffic, then well, it doesn't impact traffic. I think Zach Churchill has has suggested in his uh, pre-election campaign platform that he would remove fares from transit as a whole, not just the ferries, buses, and everything. And uh, I, you know, then there's there. I, you know, when we take the fares off, I know I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting myself, but when we take the fares off, things we end up paying for it anyway, right? But it's I, I think that it can be a barrier to to people riding riding the, the bus that have to have the, the three bucks or whatever it is in their pocket. That being said, is it enough of a barrier to get more people on the bus that gets stuck in traffic? <laughs> right? So I, 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 rapid transit lanes, I've been hearing a lot about them. I see some of the bus lanes today and I will tell you a story very quickly. I was on Bears Road coming in today and you know what that parking lot is like uh, from the, the Halifax Shopping Centre to Romans Avenue and then extends all the way up on the, uh, on the 102 through the exit, all the way up to Dunbrack. And, and, uh, there was a police car that was going to a scene that came down the 102 and got into that. And I didn't think he was going to be able to get, he did. We managed to, to squeeze over on either side enough to get that emergency vehicle through, but it was, a, it was just a regular cruiser. It wasn't a big truck, a fire truck, forget it. An ambulance, forget it. Um, but then he managed to to, to deke out into the, to the bus lane and got through the traffic. Not a, not, not a, something that I had thought about with the bus lanes, right? I know y'all dislike them, but it does give emergency vehicles access and we're not going to get people onto buses unless the buses get through the traffic. Because why, why would you? Premier Houston was in here last Friday. I told him off the air, I said, you know, the, the, the fast ferry is a great idea, but you have to do it right. You have to put a massive parking lot there because if people can't find a place to park, like at Alderney, they're not going to take it. They're just going to stay in their car and go along the Bedford Highway and we're not going to fix anything. So there's a lot of moving parts, pun intended, with with a transportation plan. But I think our first caller with John was right, that we, we need to, we need to, to, to really sit down And figure this out because it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. We've got lots of callers. I'm done talking for the day. We'll take a break. We'll get to the phones. You're listening to the open hour on the Tavino show. We're back in minutes. Welcome to the happy Halloween edition of the Tavino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. This is the open hour, 902-405-6000. An email during the break. This is from Richard who says, happy Halloween. I've been to many cities and always notice a distinct lack of honking in Halifax. That's blowing the horn. I suggest that we start to honk more <laughs> until an accident, uh, until an accident is caused. So how poor drivers know they're poor drivers. Driver drifts in the left lane. Honk, he says. Didn't signal, honk, he says. Slow in the left lane, honk, he says. Maybe something to ask the callers, love the show, and that uh, is from Richard. And then he wrote again, honk. Maybe I was supposed to insert a sound effect there. I hear honking a lot. I live on a busy street. I hear honking all the time. And uh, maybe uh, that's just my experience. Let's get right back to the phone lines. Nicole, how are you? I'm well, Dan. How are you? I'm great. What's on your mind? Good. Um, just noticing, I think, as you probably are, that uh, during this time, people are feeling extremely disempowered, frustrated, angry, and apathetic um, at the situation that we're in, specifically with this election being called. Mm. And I think it's a really great opportunity to get really honest about our collective assumption of what government is and how it functions so that we can accept that it actually doesn't do or work the way we think it does so that we can start responding differently and create new outcomes. 
And I think the most important thing that we can begin to embody and understand, and this is a direct quote from the Office of the Executive Council, Mm. is that the business of the province does not cease to operate because legislature is dissolved. And the reason that is so important is because we keep treating everything like a government and this democratic process when, in fact, first and foremost is a corporation. It is a business. It is operating as a business. And anytime we hear the word province of Nova Scotia, they're not talking about the landmass. They're not talking about the people. They are talking about a corporation that is actually registered and regulated by the United States Security and Exchange Commission. And Arthur Le- Arthur J. LeBlanc, who we know as our lieutenant governor in the legislature, is also listed on his website as the chief executive officer of the province of Nova Scotia. Tim Houston, who gets elected in as MLA and appointed premier as first minister, is also the president of the province of Nova Scotia. So what does that tell you? We have a corporation first and foremost. We do. It is. It's a massive corporation. And together, those two people, they form the governor and council, right? So they conduct business through the office of the executive council. We know it as the executive branch and the cabinet. But what we fail to realize is that everyone operates in different capacities, which are different titles. And it's our job to know who they are, where they're standing, and what contracts bind them based on those factors. Because when we assume incorrectly, they're not required to correct us based on their oath. So, for example, if we're going to Tim Houston with issues about the UARB, but we're talking to him as the premier or the MLA, he can't see us. He can't hear us. They have no jurisdiction. But as president, where he forms part of the governor and council who elects the board of the UARB, he has all the power. But if we're not talking to him as president Tim Houston, he doesn't have to answer us. So it becomes really important for us, the people, to understand the ABCD's government, which are the agency boards and commissions and departments of the province of Nova Scotia, who are all bound by contracts with each other. And the departments are regulated by the ministers who yep. are appointed to administrate. So again, 100%. in their capacity, you if you correct. go to their website, if they're, they have their constituency office and they have their business office, they are not the same person. They are two different jobs. They don't see each other. They don't talk to each other, even though it's the same person. So where this gets really interesting and why I want to go back to my original point about the business of the province doesn't cease to exist because there is no legislature, we go to the polls with the expectation that we're going to elect these MLAs that can work on our behalf, but they don't work on our behalf. They work on behalf of the province of Nova Scotia because For all intents and purposes, they appear to be trustees. They control the purse strings of the crown. They work on benefit of the crown, not for the people. If we want change, that's the purpose of the Office of the Ombudsman, because the Office of the Ombudsman is where you have to address any complaints regarding the administration of policies and procedures that the departments or the ABCs, the agency boards and commissions, um, have that may violate the acts, the legislation that we live by, Um, whether they're violating it between each other or with the public. And this is really important because, again, everything is a business first. So while we sit back and we wait for these MLAs to get appointed and we go to them and treat them like customer service and complaints, because that's pretty much what they are, they actually don't have any power inside of these contracts. It's up to us to know who we're talking to and what contracts are at play for us to actually get any meaningful change um, pushed through. And I've been operating in this capacity and with this understanding for many years now. And in situations where I've been told you have to go to an MLA, you have to go to the Human Rights Commission, uh, you have to go to a lawyer to get this uh, situation resolved, and it could take you months, if not years, I'm getting remedy within days and weeks. Because at the end of the day, these corporations can't fundamentally violate their contracts. So when we stop looking at everything as laws and policies and contracts and government and actually start looking at it as a function of a business where people have liabilities that they are responsible for and are not indemnified if they break those contracts, things start to change. People start to take more accountability and responsibility um, for what they are perpetrating, but no one outside of you will ever take more responsibility for you than you do for yourself, which is why any change that we have has to be an outside, like an inside out job. And we cannot, cannot rely on the MLAs um, or this election process to fix the problems that um, have us feeling so disempowered, frustrated, angry, and apathetic. Nicole, that is uh, that is well thought out and uh, well said, and uh, uh, there's lots there for me to unpack. I'm going to have to dig into that. I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. And all of this information is on the government website, so I'm not bringing you anything that they don't have in plain sight. Have a great day.
Thanks. 902-405-6000. My only uh, addition to that would be, and I know this is pie on the sky thinking, that if if we if we look at the province and and she's right it is a corporation right it's there's a board and and there's you know uh, the the whole inner workings that she laid out but wouldn't it be something if that business had to run like a business and couldn't run a deficit think about that during the break we need to stop down and take another break. Blake is going to update us on the news. And uh, on the other side, we'll continue the open hour. Just something that came across my desk very quickly. And I hope I don't scoop Blake on this. Uh, the, the Halifax Regional Police now updating that collision this morning on uh, at the corner of Spring Garden and South Park Street. A 24-year-old woman was hit by a Halifax Transit bus. That woman, unfortunately, pronounced dead at the scene. Police are no longer there. The area on South Park Street, Spring Garden, now open to pedestrians and vehicle traffic. So again, that accident this morning was a fatal one. A uh, 24-year-old woman hit by a Halifax Transit bus pronounced it at the scene. The street now is uh, open to traffic. We're back after the break. Werewolves of London, appropriate song for Halloween. Hope you're having a fantastic day. The lines, well, there's a couple open, 902-405-6000. Let's get to as many as we can. Marion, how are you? Fine, thanks. You're quite, you're, what's on your mind? Well, uh, I have brought to mind, sadly, we have another pedestrian deceased by being hit by a vehicle. Mm. And I drove through Dartmouth this week stopped three times at the flashing lights for pedestrians, and three people drove, walked across, and not one of them looked either way. In fact, one woman had a hood so far over her head that she couldn't see anything, I don't think. And repeatedly, I see pedestrians who walk right out into the crosswalk without looking at all. I mean, I have friends that do it. So I think as pedestrians, we have a responsibility here and I feel very, I know it's, the driver has made an error perhaps, but it's still, they have to live with the consequences of that as well. So we're really impacting a lot of people by not taking our responsibility as a pedestrian and look both ways, whether or not we're in a crosswalk, whether or not a light is flashing. Marion, appreciate the call. Okay. 902-405-6000, that's 902-405-6000. Uh, with this incident on Spring Garden Road, we don't know what happened, so we, we won't prejudge that. Uh, but I think that Marion's comments, I think many of you have raised those comments here on this program before, that, uh, that you know, it's a shared responsibility. I always think that it's, you know, it's my life, man. So I always try and protect it. And I'll look both ways at, uh, at, the, uh, at any time I cross the road, no matter if the lights are flashing or not, because sometimes the drivers don't stop for the lights, do they? Mark, how are you? Oh, I'm good, Dan. Um, thanks for taking my call. Um, I was actually uh, on hold before the news broke about uh, this lady passing away. And so obviously, very sad condolences to her family and friends. That's terrible. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's really terrible. And I, I was going to call about the traffic issue because of your first caller. It's when I called in. Um, so I agree. Um, so for context, I live downtown, mm-hmm. like right downtown, Morris Street, if you know where that is. Do. And uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> So it, it is the increase, and it's always been a busy street, a busy neighborhood, uh, well, but I mean, the, the increase, even in the, the last year or so, it's just uh, of, of cars, of, of, you know, people are coming back to work. There's a lot of immigration. A lot of people settle in the South End uh, here. It's, it need, we need more traffic enforcement. I don't know, like, if we even have a traffic enforcement unit, like major cities would uh, do. We're turning into a major city. And whether we like it or not, I mean, we're not going to, you know, be Toronto numbers, but they have, they do a better job in cities like that. They've, we, I never see, I never, I can frankly ne- say never, never see any enforcement. I see pe- people running, uh, drivers running through crosswalks all the time. As your last caller said, I, yep, I also see pedestrians not paying attention. The level of road rage, pedestrian rage, me, I've been yelling at people. I yelled at someone last night just for speeding, and then that can lead to bad things, so I'm not necessarily advocating that. As for the email about honking, he must not live downtown <laughs> right. or the north end. <laughs> exactly. But, 
but yeah, but anyway, it's it's re- it's it's really bad. I, I think you know the idea is about transit, but we've been talking about fixing tra- fixing transit. Okay, I'm 44 years old. I've been talking about that since I was like 14, 15. So you know, either put up or shut up. So I really hope that uh, these aren't just empty promises. Uh, something needs to be done, and enforcement's part of it, and better transit, and just get rid of those bike lanes. And you know, that's a problem too. And no more bike lanes. John Cleary, okay, if you're out there listening, it's no more. Experiment's over, in my opinion. Mark, I appreciate your call. Thank you. Have a good one. 902-405-6000. Ryan, how are you? Good. How are yourself? I am well. What's on your mind today? Well, let's talk about traffic um, and, and transit and those kind of things. First of all, uh, you, you made a comment about uh, the high-speed ferry and how you have to have ample parking. Right. I've been thinking that for all the bus terminals for years, especially the one up on, on Portland Hills or the one out in, in Lower Sackville, they're packed. The parking lot is packed every single day. You drive by at 730, it's already full. So how many more people do you think are going to be parking there to take the bus? Well, that's not even if they, can, they can't because there's nowhere to park. Then what do you do? You just stay in your car, right? Well, exactly. So I, I don't, and, I, and I've been thinking that for years. Like, why don't they put in an above ground parking structure here? They just built a giant one at the hospital. Doesn't it make sense to, you know, build a few more at some of these places? You get more cars there, more people will be taking those buses. But, I mean, that aside, um, and this is anecdotal, but it's something that I've been noticing more and more. Um, over the summer, this past summer, I didn't find the traffic was really all that bad. But as soon as school started back up in September, I found it got ridiculous to the point where I, I drive from Sackville up to Fall River every day. And that exit on the highway over the summer, there was never once uh, any delay. As soon as September rolled around, now you 10 minutes sitting on the highway trying to get through the exit. That's how ridiculous it's gotten. And anybody who drives around any of the neighborhoods or schools will tell you, first thing in the morning, there's more kids getting dropped off by their parents driving them than there are getting dropped off by, by bus or that are walking or cycling. And the same thing, come, come 1 o'clock in the afternoon, there's already parents lined up both sides of the street for blocks around waiting to pick their kids up. I, I think a lot of the congestion, is, especially in the morning, has to do with parents driving their kids to school. And I don't, I don't get that. My parents didn't drive me to school. We took the bus or we walked the two or three blocks away. You're not helping it. And when you consider these children are supposed to be the ones that care the most about climate change, they seem all too happy to get into a car and be chauffeured around. Brian, I appreciate your call. Have a good day, Dan. 902-405-6000. Let's uh, welcome John to the program. John, how are you? Oh, good morning. What's on your mind? I was just thinking about uh, uh, how to maybe help eliminate all the cars that are coming into the city. Hmm. And I was thinking about if they provided free transit from the people that are coming from the Valley and from Toro and anywhere, if people were able to take a bus free of charge and leave their cars home or somewhere parked in a parking lot somewhere or that would provide for them, wouldn't that help uh, eliminate maybe some cars, all these cars coming in from the rural areas? What do you think? It might, but there would be all kinds of logistics associated with that because people are on different schedules and different times. So it couldn't be just one bus. There would have to be well, no, I was a just series of buses. I was wondering if there was right? a place where they could park their cars. I get it. When, and, but there would have to be buses that take them into the city or wherever they're going, right? And if, if somebody gets off at 3 and somebody gets off at 5, how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, I understand that. I, I was wondering if there was just one spot that where if they could get off at a certain part downtown that was close to where they were going to work. I don't know. I just thought it might help. The other thing is I just want to mention, too, is I'd like to put this out to pedestrians. When you're going across the street, for example, or on a, or, you know, anywhere, if you seek, if you've got the right of way, but you see cars coming, let the car go by before you try to try to go across the street, because you don't know what that driver is thinking or if they're watching you or not. Let them go by so that you have a clear 
position to go across the street. But we can also I say that to drivers, know. can't we, John? What's that? We can also say that to drivers because the oh, Highway definitely. Traffic Act, the but Highway, you no, know, hang it's, on, the Highway Traffic, the, the Highway Traffic Act it. says that the pedestrian has the right of way. So by well, yes, by blaming the the pedestrian for getting hit by the car, we can't do that, can we? No, no, but I'm just saying if, if I'm going across the street and even though I've got the right of way, right. I still let the car go by without having to him for it stop and then I'll proceed because it's only a second. Let let the car go. Yes, in case, for example, how many senior citizens out there are driving that don't have peripheral vision or anything, you know, you, you never know that. So it, it, I think it's safe. Let the car go by before I go, you know, enter the, the crosswalk. John, I appreciate your call. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Taking our last break in the open hour. You're listening to the Todd Vino Show. We're back in minutes. Thanks. Vanessa is grooving to this, but she is. Welcome back to the Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. Hope you're having a fantastic day. We've got lots of callers, so let's get right back to the phone lines. Welcome David to the program. David, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Dan? I'm good. What's on your mind? Yes, yeah, so I just want to talk briefly about the traffic. Sure. I see a lot of people talking about um, the influx, the immigration, and all of those things. I'm an immigrant myself. I've been here for probably about like 10, 12 years. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem that I believe is, one, there's a lot of construction going on at the same time. Agreed. And so that slows down traffic a lot. And, for example, the road trip roundabout where you are probably supposed to um, do it at night. That's how big cities do. Uh, when you are doing it on a Monday morning, it's going to cause a lot of traffic. Um, and I think somewhere like that road trip roundabout needs like a traffic light so that it makes things actually really easy instead of like having to wait for somebody to go around and all of that. But one thing is that I think a lot of people have this misconception about immigration. So it's just a very few set of people that come in through maybe like refugee or asylum seeking. A lot of uh, immigrants are actually professionals where they're coming from, they're top of the top because there's, there's a ranking system before they can get in and they pay a lot of money to actually get in. I don't know if a lot of people know that. They actually pay a lot of money before they can get in, like the application process and all of that. So it's not as if they are just coming out of like, oh, um, something is wrong and all of those things. Again, I think we are abdicating the responsibility of the government in the sense that the government knows how much people they are expecting with immigration. And Halifax is like an old city where nothing has really changed. Like they've not improved infrastructure. They've not put in things. They've not put in like alternative uh, transport system. I would have expected that in this, like, 2024, there should be a proper transportation from, like, here to Windsor, here to the valley, but there's nothing. Everybody has to drive. And so that's one of the things that's actually causing, like, the traffic because everybody is driving. Um, there's no, if you want to go to valley now, you have to drive. You can't even, there's no bus for you to even go there. And when it comes to construction again, instead of expanding wide, let me give you a typical example at the, at, at the HI. Um, now they've, they've broken down the parking system. So there's no parking for staff. There's no parking for patients um, while trying to expand. Why not build um, that expansion elsewhere where you can create more parking space where the concentration at that city center will actually be moved out? You understand? I think those things will sort um, all those things um, for me, and then they're putting up a lot, a lot of new signs. Um, you can't pass here from here to this time, from this time. It also causes a lot of traffic. They should find ways uh, where people can go in through. Thank you. That's my contribution. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. 902-405-6000. Keith, how are you? Uh, good morning, Dan. How are you doing? Thanks for um, holding for so long. I appreciate it. What's on your mind? That's okay. Um, I just wanted, well, first of all, I'd like to pass along condolences to that person that uh, passed away this morning with that uh, accident there That's in Spring Garden. Yeah, for sure. And also the hope the person that got hit before is in the hospital. Uh, I hope they pull through. Um, so that being said, um, I used to ride my bike. I uh, used to go downtown on the street and that, but uh, uh, it's just too much traffic now. 
so I don't need to go anywhere, you know, like to go to work or anything on a bike. So I just simply sold my bike. Said, no, I'm not going to tempt fate because uh, I had I had a close call a few years ago. I won't get into it, but uh, I'm here. So obviously, right. <laughs> You know, uh, but um, I just like to kind of switch gears here a little bit. Um, are you allowed to ride a bike on sidewalks? No, no, it's against law. And are you supposed to wear a helmet? You are. Okay. Um, so I've had three uh, occasions on three different streets here where I was just walking on the sidewalk. And people on bikes uh, came up behind me. Um, and you can't hear a bike unless you say something or you have some kind of a Ring device a bell. on your bike. Yep. Yeah, or a horn or a beeper. You can't hear them. And, uh, geez, I've almost been hit three times. No, I hear you. Like, not too long ago, uh, there was uh, over here where I, where I live out in the uh, I won't name my place where I live, but uh, there was a person came zooming by me, and I had no idea. It happened to me once on Bering Street, I will say that. But um, so I'm just wondering, you know, I'm just trying to put it out there that not to spread panic, but if you're walking on a sidewalk, just sometimes glance back over your shoulder because if you got hit, by a person on a bike that weighed maybe 150 pounds on a bike traveling at a high speed, you get to have some serious damage. It'll hurt. Uh, we'll do more than hurt, I would say. Yep. Uh, but anyway, I guess that's kind of my um, story for this morning. Just to kind of watch, you got to be paying. You have to have your head on a swivel when you're walking and when you're driving, because the driving too is another thing, as you know. Um, there's a lot of Near misses every day uh, between pedestrians and cars. Cars not paying attention. Pedestrians not paying attention. So you just got to be aware of your, got to be aware of your surroundings more, and uh, you know just pay attention because uh, there's more and more traffic out there now. Keith, and I appreciate the call. People- Have a good one. Nine zero two four zero five six thousand. That's nine zero two four zero five six thousand is the number. Let's try to get to some more people. There have been people holding for a long time. Tim, how are you? Good, Dan. How are you? Good. What's on your mind? My condolences to the, the family of the young woman that uh, lost her life on Spring Garden. But in any event, uh, tragic, but uh, you know, we'll leave it at that. Um, the, the issue with Mr. Houston and the tolls, mm-hmm. and I guess this is what I would ask him specifically, is he had three years, uh, you know, three years plus in government, um, never heard a word about him trying to reduce the tool, tolls off of uh, um, the bridges and ferries and that. Now, all of a sudden, that's an issue. My concern is this. If I don't use the bridges or the ferry on a regular basis, um, the money's got to come from somewhere, and like always, it's in the details. Unfortunately, he has neglected to provide details on where that $40 million is going to come uh, from to pay the maintenance on the the bridges, so on and so forth. I'd be concerned about where it's going to come from because if I don't use the, the bridges or the ferries on a regular basis, my property tax is going to go up, if so, by how much? Or where else is that money going to come from? Because it's, he can't just eliminate $40 million. It's got to come from somewhere. And unfortunately, as an accountant, um, he's neglected to provide those details to the voters who are going to have to make an informed decision. Great point, Tim. I appreciate it. Thank you. Nine zero two four zero five six thousand. I'll take that one step further, not to steal any time. But what does somebody that's that's living in Truro or Yarmouth or Sydney think about the provincial government spending forty million dollars a year to fix the Halifax Harbour bridges when the tolls were paying for it at one point, or at least a good chunk of it? Let's go back to the phones, and we will get Jim. How are you? Good morning, Dan. How are you? I am well. What's on your mind? I want to tell you what I saw this morning with a driver. I came around the Larry Utech roundabouts, yep. heading in towards uh, Bears Lake. Okay. And there was an accident. There was an accident, and traffic was like a parking lot there. Mm-hmm. 
I'm in that lane coming from Larry Utech that goes to um, Kearney Lake exit. Yep. And I'm driving up there, and I see a driver in a half-ton truck. He decides there's nowhere to go. He decides to back up between the oncoming traffic, which is me, and the guardrail, and he's going to back up a half a kilometer right back to the Larry Utech roundabouts, somehow get turned around there, and go on his own way. Wow. Uh, yeah, we all wonder. We all wonder how accidents happen, and people like that are on the road. You know, I find I a find it happens a lot, truck, right? I like to say people or because I, I find it happens a lot that people do things that are, uh, I'll say, out of the ordinary um, because they they just lose their patience, right? Yeah. The way you got, you can't lose your patience. I know you're right, but you gotta. I'm sitting there. I'm in a hurry too. I got. I'm looking at a half hour to get through this traffic, but I'm not going to do anything as stupid as that guy. Wow. Thank Jim. you for a minute or so, <laughs> I Dan. Appreciate and it, go Jim. Leafs go, buddy. Go Leafs go. I hear you. 902-405-6000. Last word today goes to Pauline. Pauline, how are you? How are you? I just wanted to say happy Halloween. Well, thank you. And, nobody, and nobody's been talking about Halloween, and I just want to say, like, what our family did okay. and does. Every year, um, my grandson, he makes up like a bingo card with ghosts on it. And uh, we go around in, um, in our area and we cross off the things that are on people's property. Okay. And so that's why we have fun. Before, as soon as we have supper, we um, clean out the uh, pumpkins and we make pumpkins and we really make a night of it. And we go out and we do this in the neighborhood. And we really, really have fun. I just wanted to know that people can have fun on Halloween. Well, I appreciate you sharing, Pauline. Okay. Have a great Bye. Halloween. Happy Halloween. 902-405-6000 is the number. We'll reopen those telephone lines again tomorrow. The Friday free-for-all will take over. For those that didn't get on the air this morning, my apologies to you. Uh, but we'll do it again tomorrow, again at 11 o'clock. And I hope that you join the program. We're going to stop down and take a break. When we come back, last Thursday of the month, that means it's time for Dr. Jeff Goodall, our veterinarian, to join the program. If you have some questions about your pets, this is your opportunity to get them answered. Dr. Jeff Goodall will be here after the news. You're listening to The Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Alstrand. We're back in minutes. Thanks. My eyes beheld an eerie sight, for my monster from his slab began to rise, and suddenly, to my surprise... I know we talk about him a he lot in here, and man. there's a good reason why we do. It's because the darn studio that I'm sitting in is named after the guy, but I'll tell you what, every time we had a Halloween show, that was Rick Howe's favorite song. He would just sit in his, he had a little area here and, and uh, have it on the, on the speakers, and he'd be listening to that Monster Mash song all day. Anyway, we miss you, Rick. We miss you a lot. It's time for Ask the Veterinarian, uh, our weekly look at uh, the world of pets and dogs and cats and all kinds of pets. If you have a question to ask Dr. Jeff Goodall, our veterinarian, this is your opportunity, and we're very pleased to welcome him to the program. Dr. Jeff, are you all set for Halloween? All set. How's everybody out there? We're, uh, we're, we're, we're counting down the minutes and hours till we can go trick-or-treating. Yeah, I just buy my own candy now. Going to door to door dressed as a veterinarian is a bit much. Yeah, this is what I told Vanessa. I dressed up as. Uh, it took me a long time to put this Dan Olstrand costume together, but I managed to pull it off. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it's better than the alternative. Oh, hi to Todd if you're out there listening. Hope absolutely, you're doing well. absolutely, Todd. And I know he's a little bit disappointed today because his Yankees lost the World Series, but he'll get over it, I'm sure. Uh, the yeah, telephone number again is 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Dr. Jeff here for the next hour to ask your, your, uh, your pet questions. If you have a concern about your dog, your cat, your bird, your pet, this is your opportunity. Uh, Dr. Jeff, it's Halloween, and uh, at this time of year is exciting for, for parents. It's exciting for kids. Maybe exciting for your pets, but can also be a little bit of a traumatic experience, can it not? Right. So, you know, we're a bit too close to time tonight to talk about anxiety management. But the big thing is, you know, if you're putting a costume on your dog, 
you know, you should have tried it out multiple times before tonight. Um, you know, don't use paint on your animal. I've seen that could cause some problems. And of course, have a safe space in your home or a leash a tied to a very secure object so that your cat or dog can't get away. Preferably cats just be locked in a bedroom with their litter pan, some food and some water and dogs under control all the time because they get excited too, you know. Uh, it can be really tra traumatic for them. But I'm just gonna touch on, we've seen a real rise in our clinic, I can't speak for everybody else, in chocolate toxicity in the last three weeks. Really weird, like don't see these many cases all my associates are like, this is really weird. So basically just please keep in mind, and most people do, that chocolate is just bad for dogs. And uh, if you don't get the dog to us within 30 minutes, it can become a bit of a pro uh, production to get the uh, theobromide out or at least manage it. And, you know, ca it, it's basically like caffeine overdose, nervousness, twitching, panting, vomiting. Then sometimes they'll get abdominal pain, uh, Milk chocolate is, I'm going to use air quotations, relatively safe, but those darker chocolates are really problematic. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to mention before we go to the phone, because it's important to get to the people, um, chewing gum, anything, gummies, anything. I'm not saying people are giving gummies at Halloween, <laughs> but I have to bring up xylitol. Xylitol is that artificial sweetener. And for example, I was surprised. I did some research the other day just for curiosity. Again, the, the amount of xylitol in chewing gum varies so dramatically that some of these chewing gums out there with those tiny small sticks can actually poison a small dog. Just one stick. Um, it cause, Basically, xylitol causes a dramatic loss in blood sugar in the bloodstream, and the dog can literally <clears throat> excuse me, pass out and then pass away. Um, so if there's any chewing gum or anything artificially sweetened, just really be careful. And again, you know, it's not a phone call to the vet to say, hey, what do I do? It's a phone call to say, hey, it's done. Whether it's chocolate or xylitol, it's done. I'm on my way down. And bring the package with you, whatever it is, chocolate, uh, gum, or whatever, and bring it so that the vets can try to figure out the dose. Last night, literally last night, we had a case of a little goofy uh, French bulldog who ate, you know, those chocolate ma milk chocolate macaroons. Mm. And boy, he wasn't happy when we made him vomit. Uh, but uh, uh, it all he's all fine. And, you know, because the owner was, you know, right on top of things. So enough on that. Let's get to the phones, I guess. But just, you know, xylitol, chocolate, and then get somewhere secure for your pet to to enjoy tonight as much as you want to. 902-405-6000 is the telephone number. The lines are wide open if you have a question to ask our veterinarian, Dr. Jeff. This is your opportunity to to get those questions answered, get them in, get them off quickly, and uh, and move on your, with your day. Dr. Jeff, I had an email question that was sent in before we started this, uh, this segment this afternoon, and it reads this, Dr. Jeff, I have a, a small dog at home, six years old, uh, tends to become a little less friendly during the fall and winter season. Not sure if it's some sort of seasonal disorder. Is there something that I can do to, to maybe bring that around? Wow, it'd be no nice to know a little more about it. I mean, basically what we're talking about is anxiety again. It's odd to be seasonal. I don't really remember that in my somewhat long time of doing this. Mm. But what I would say is talk to your vet about getting something called Composure Pro Treats or Calming Care. You can put on the food um, because, you know, this doesn't sound like it's a medication situation. It sounds like it's a supplement situation. So those two products are really popular in our practice. We use a liquid called Nutricom. And all these products, to, oh, and there's one called Xyl, um, uh, um, um, Dalkeen, and that uh, basically these products together combine different things like tryptophan, which everybody knows is in Turkey. It combines, oddly enough, catnip in dogs can be calming. It can combine um, uh, milk casein, which basically is a protein in milk that reduces uh, anxiety. And then the calming care product is really unique on the market. It is a basically a, pro <clears throat> a probiotic targeted to reducing the bacteria in the gut in a way that reduces anxiety. Now it's relatively complicated, but very well known 
in uh, human uh, autism patients that you can reduce the spectrum if you change their diet. So there's a few things that he can look into that don't necessitate a veterinary visit. He can just email, he or she, sorry, could just email their, their veterinarian and say, hey, composure your treats. Can I pick these up? They are veterinary only. Um, Nutricom, which I think is still veterinary only. Um, calming care and go from there. A lot, of, I'm not anti pet stores. I want to be clear on this, but a lot of the stuff when I wander through the pet stores, it just seems not exactly what I would want. But I certainly have some clients who say, you know, uh, stuff at the pet store worked for them. So I'm not anti that. And then I have had some clients say that uh, CBD products will work. Uh, keep in mind that in Canada, CBD is not licensed for veterinary use, so I can't comment on it. Sure. Um, it's uh, All I'll say there is I, if you're going to do this, and there's information websites in the States, is use the stuff out of the NSLC. Don't use the stuff off the Internet. Again, I'm not anti the Internet. Uh, there's some good things out there, but most of these products that I clients have brought in, I can't see any uh, really effective testing results on them when I go online. So that's a long answer, but uh, those are some options over the counter for the gentleman or man, whatever it was. Dr. Jeff, uh, with the change of the season, uh, we, we were talking about this with, uh, with John Gillis, our, our human doctor yesterday about yeah. uh, a lack of, a lack of daylight and a lack of vitamin D. I don't know if vitamin D works the same as it does in, in humans and pets, but with the change of the seasons, with, with the, the days getting shorter, the nights getting longer, uh, and, uh, and perhaps maybe the humans not wanting to, to get out and maybe walk us as much as they do normally in the summer, could that all be contributing factors to that? To anxiety, yes. It's a really good point. I should have thought of it. Um, I mean, they don't need vitamin D if the uh, animal's diet is balanced, so we don't need to worry too, too much about that. Um, calcitriol, I think it's called, is um, basically vitamin D. And, um, you know, animals have learned, unlike us who have skin exposure, dogs and cats don't really have uh, skin exposure to convert vitamin D or the calcitriol into vitamin D and so on and so forth. So basically, same rules apply. I mean, when the clocks go back this weekend, um, your people's anxiety is going to change and stress is going to change. And um, don't drive on Hammond's Plains Road on <laughs> Monday, I think. But anyway, that's a shot at Hammond's Plains. But anyway, I um, love the area, but uh, don't like the road. And uh, basically anticipate your dog or cat, uh, even birds. I used to have birds. And they found it weird that our, our times of waking up, birds are very, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, used to structure. And uh, they have to have a bad time. They have to have a wake up time. And it really messed my birds up. But uh, there you go. But it's no, it's not a big problem. You don't need to supplement with vitamin D or anything like that. Dr. Jeff Goodall is here for the next 45 minutes. If you have a pet related question, the number is 902 405 6000. We're going to take a break. You're listening to the Tavino Show. We're back in minutes. Welcome back. Dr. Jeff Goodall here for the next 45 minutes. If you have a pet related question, if you have something that your pet's doing that's peculiar, maybe they want a, a second opinion on something or just have a plain old question, this is your opportunity. 904, uh, 902. <laughs> wow. Only see that number 10,000 times a day. 902 405 6000 is the number. Uh, Dr. Jeff, we'll go right to the phone lines and we'll welcome Barry to the show. Barry, how are you? Not too bad. Your question for Dr. Jeff, please. Uh, I've got a two and a half year old Cavapoo. He's very mild mannered. He loves people, but uh, anytime I'm driving him in the car and he's looking out the window or he's laying on the couch in the living room and there's a dog comes on the TV or a dog walking along the road, he absolutely goes bananas. Okay. So how old your dog there, sir? Uh, two and a half. Okay. So, you know, there's not going to be an easy fix here. I'm smiling because, you know, my own, some of my own creatures will react. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't, I don't imagine there is a simple fix. No. So, uh, and before I forget, sorry, just about vitamin D, the last question I have used it in cases of kidney disease. So if your pet is out there, listeners with a pet with kidney disease, you may want to talk about vitamin D for your, uh, 
for your uh, dog. It's a little dicey in cats. Anyway, uh, yeah. the same things apply here, sir. I would consider the uh, calming care or com- uh, sorry, composure pro treats and or the calming care uh, a powder again, over the counter. You don't need to have a veterinary visit, at least not in our clinic. I can't speak for all of them. Uh, you know, these are effective products. They take a while. So you're not going to see like some of them take up to six weeks to have their full effect. I think common care for some clients has worked within two weeks. Uh, the composure pro treats uh, usually somewhere between two and six weeks. Uh, Nutricom usually two Nutricom is another, it's a liquid you can put on the food. It's really inexpensive. Uh, those are the way to approach this because obviously your dog's not, horribly anxiety and getting a trainer in is a little expensive. Uh, it's an endearing quality in the Cavaliers anyway. So, you know, in a sense, you want a dog to bark when, when things are around to let you know what's going on, but there's no simple answer to that other than I would talk, or if you're going in, in the next little while to your, for your annual visit, talk to your vet about Zalkine. Um, it's a really effective uh, calming agent that is, not that inexpensive. I mean, some of this stuff, uh, the Composure Pro Treats and the Common Care are very reasonably priced now. There you go. Yeah, but the other, the, like I said, the only the only time that he reacts at all, like uh, when I take him out for right. a walk and he comes, he's around people, and uh, he, he's very calm. He, he loves people, but like I said, when he sees a dog, he just goes absolutely bananas. So, yeah. thank you no, for your... No, no, no. Uh, it is an anxiety thing, though, so it's something to think about because it could – he's only – i sorry to interrupt you. I, he's only young, and this problem, whatever you want to call it, could morph into more problems, more easily triggered. Uh, so the sooner we get on it, the better. There you go. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Barry. Appreciate the call. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Back to the phones, and we welcome Derek to the program. Derek, how are you? Great. I was just wondering if Dr. Jeff has any knowledge of a lot of the research that's going on right now with people who are actually recording dogs and are going to put it through AI and saying there's going to be an app soon that we're going to be able to talk to our dogs. Oh, I've heard of it, but I don't have much to say on it. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, they're doing the same thing with whale sounds now, and uh, I heard the same things going on with cats. Um, I don't know much about it. I'm just going to sit back and wait. Um, I'm just worried that it'll train the dogs and the cats <laughs> to take over the world. That's right. honestly my worry. They already run well, most of it, don't they, Dr. Jeff? <laughs> What's that, Dr. They, 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 all, they already run most of the world, don't they? Well, I mean, you know, like, like my worry is, to be sincere, the cats are going to attack us in our sleep, right? <laughs> they just wait. Or they're going to make sure they're by our feet when we get up in the morning to trip us into the wall. Um, the dogs will probably just sit there and say, now I know where the food is and I can just take care of things myself. Derek, I appreciate the call, sir. I honestly don't have an answer. Have a great day. I know two four zero five six thousand is the number. Uh, uh, most people will tell you, Dr. Jeff, at least when it comes to dogs, that they already talk to their animals, right? Well, I mean, animals are really, especially, well, birds as well, but dogs and birds, I don't think cats really give a damn, but they pick up on so many subtle cues. I'm, uh, I'm just amazed. Um, even owners with anxiety, they can bring out anxiety in their dog or their dog will work to help the owner's anxiety come down. As we know, service dogs are like that. I have a service dog, well, I have a qualified service dog for that myself. And um, they're pretty awesome. I don't think we need to know what they're saying. We know through facial expressions, eye position, ear position, tail position, what they want. I mean, keep in mind that, you know, there's a lot, uh, as an alternative, sorry, uh, going off on a tangent, I'm still worried about dog bites in kids and, and people, parents need to train their kids. And I do mean it, train. I'm sorry to say behavior is behavior. They need to remind their child because they have a dog in their home. The dog probably loves everybody in the home, of course, but not every dog out there loves kids. And, you know, make sure you don't corner the dog. Make sure we train kids to, you know, put their hand, you know, if, if a dog's on leash to ask, hey, can I pet your dog? Will your dog let me pet it? You know, a, a nice introduction, then they put their hand out, palm up, under the dog's nose, not on top of the head. You know, nobody likes having their head patted, unless you know the person really well. Uh, <laughs> palm out, rub the chin, avoid the belly, just, you know, sort of the sides of the head, not the ears, 
sides of the head and sides of the chest. Uh, because again, uh, about two months, three months ago now, we had a client whose dog is actually in the clinic, extremely good natured, really good with the family at home, but it nipped at a child on the street. And, you know, I understand the parent was upset. The, uh, the parent of the child was upset, but the owner did the right thing, came in right away and said, well, pretty much right away and said, you know, do, does my dog have a problem? Is it developing an issue? Right. Um, and, well, you know, just for the teachers out there, if you have time in your curricula, talk to your local veterinarian about having them come in and have he or she talk about preventing dog bites in kids. A tangent, but thank you. No, no, great points, Dr. Jeff. And it's the same when uh, when people meet Dan for the first time. Palms up. Well, I've heard a, about you, but I'm and, not saying it. And avoid the belly, because I don't like my yeah. belly being scratched. Let's just leave that alone. Thanks. <laughs> Dr. Jeff, we're going to take another break. He's going to be around for another 30 minutes. If you have a pet-related question after the news, it's your opportunity. You're listening to Ask the Pet right here on the Todd Fino Show. I'm Dan Holstrand. We're back in minutes. Welcome back. This is the Tavino Show. It's Ask the Veterinarian. Dr. Jeff Goodall is here, and he's here to answer your questions. 902-405-6000 is the number. Again, it's 902-405-6000. We welcome Gina to the program. Gina, how are you? Good. Your question, please. I have a three-year-old dash hound. And he's somewhat trained. He goes out in the morning to urinate and whatever. But if he's in the house throughout the day and I don't catch him, he will urinate on, like, the chair legs and that. How do I stop him from doing that? Is he neutered? No. Well, there's not, your primary problem, ma'am. Yeah, he's okay. three years old. He's three years old, is that yeah. what you said? Okay, yeah. so, you know, unfortunately, you know, the longer you wait, like, I, there is some evidence. I mean, there's there's conflicting evidence, too, that uh, neutering might help with that behavior. It could be marking behavior uh, and what have you. So neutering might be something to consider. However, you know, you got to plan that out. And, and obviously, you know, veterinary services for surgery aren't inexpensive. I know that. So now what you need to do is uh, hmm, I would – get a hold of a behaviorist as soon as possible, uh, get a home mm-hmm. visit in and get them, he or she, to help guide you on some tricks to get your puppy more or better house trained. Is your dog uh, kennel trained, perhaps? Trained to sleep in a kennel? Somewhat. He prefers not to, but... <laughs> when you say prefers not to, it, it's kind of a yes or no thing. If you put him he... in the kennel, does he sleep? Yes. Okay. Yeah, but well, then, he's a little bit coiled. Well, that's where I'm he's going. Is, you know, like you need to, you know, I spoil my dog, but I won't let her have an accident in the house. You may need to consider uh, kenneling when you're out of the house and uh, make okay. that a positive experience. So you can Google how to kennel train your dog, or you can talk to your veterinarian who knows your dog better than I do, and uh, kennel train as a temporary measure. Um, because, you know, you, once they start soiling, especially urination, mind you, there's a temptation to keep doing that because of just the the pheromones and what have you in the urine itself. So, you know, you also need to go to, uh, you know, a very good quality uh, cleaning supply company and get uh, a cleaner that is enzymatic to get rid of the urine and try to start beating that, that smell down as much as you can. There's many products out there. Your vet will carry some, but also, you know, the local janitor supply stores can do that as well. And you're going to need to get rid of that uh, odor, Uh, even though you might not smell it, he can. And uh, kennel it. You you basically have to stop the opportunity. And that's the simplest way to look at this is if you kennel him, because you're saying it happens most of the time when you're out. So when you're out, you're going to kennel him. No, I mean, yeah, I'm in the house at the time it happens. I just don't see him do it. No, no, I'm getting there, but I'm just saying you also mentioned it it happens when he's out of the house, I thought. So when you're out of the house, when you're in the the house, you basically have to leash him to you while you're doing this training program that the behaviorist is going to help you with because you do need assistance. I can't in five or less minutes give you all the tricks or you can talk to your veterinarian probably by email and see what he or she has to say. 
But in the end, uh, leash your dog to you. And I know that sounds pretty silly, but you're not going to let them have a failure. Once you start this program, both with kenneling and training him to go outside, you know, you can, you're just not going to let him fail. The moment he thinks he's going to urinate, he's a small dog. You pick him up and you get him outside. And that means having, okay. you know, your coat. That means getting, having your coat and a bag of treats special for training only at the door with your umbrella because the moment you decide to start this, it's going to start raining or snowing. So the moment he starts, mm -hmm. you know, looking like he's going to pee because you have him leashed to you, you're not going to let him fail. You're going to scoop him up, get to the door, pop your coat on, boots, umbrella, and out you go. And you're going to positively reinforce when he goes outside that um, he gets a special little treat, which he really craves. So you have to pick something that he really, really wants and work your way towards okay. that. But I would basically, to summarize, email your vet, get to see if who he or she recommends for a behaviorist, and go that way. But I would immediately start kenneling them uh, when you're not in the home. And at night when you're sleeping to make sure there's no accidents at night, because we have to stop this now. And then that uh, enzymatic cleaner, and then take things from there. Thanks, Gina. I appreciate the call. 902-405-6000 is the number. 902-405-6000. Let's welcome Greg to the show. Greg, how are you? Hey, good. Thanks. Yourself? Good. Your question, please. Yeah, so I have a dog, Lacey. She's about eight years old. I adopted her when she was a year and a half old. And she has a rock addiction. Um, mm -hmm. So, And like when I say rock, more like fist-sized boulders. She just likes to carry them. Um, she doesn't eat them or chew on them. She'll just, like, if we're on a hike or at Shuby Park, she'll carry these boulders sometimes for, like, 30 minutes. And uh, I've noticed it started to wear on her teeth quite a bit. The vet doesn't seem too concerned about it. I just wanted to know if maybe in your travels you've come across something like that because it's, it's kind of strange behavior. Actually, I've seen it pretty commonly. There was an infamous dog in our practice. He lived up in Jador on the ocean and uh, when I met him kayaking out there and we were kayaking by the shoreline and this big old goofy retriever came out and dove in the water and wanted to show everybody they could pick up rocks from under the water and bring them to the kayaks. So he yeah. became a client, his teeth were horribly damaged and you know what? Yeah. He never looked back. He never looked back. He never had oral disease. He never had pain in his mouth. Um, basically there, you know, again here, I guess we have to decide if it's a problem or not, and it's probably not. I'm not saying your vet is dismissing, nor am I, the situation. It's not perfect, but as long as he's not eating the rock or gravel or something like that, then you know what? He, it's it, There's a retriever aspect in this where some of them decide it's uh, calming for the animal. Retrievers are basically, they release endorphins when they're holding things in their mouths, and so this dog has okay. some, sort of re, uh, some sort of connection to that endorphin release and it helps it makes them happy so you know he's not chewing on it he's probably chipping the enamel on his teeth uh, you know just every year get an assessment uh, i would take pictures of the teeth and uh you know once every three to four months so you have your own record of what's going on in case something changes and go from there but it, it, i'm not going to say it's not a problem i'm just going to say it's yeah. common and it rarely seems to lead to serious problems Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate the call. 902-405-6000. Dr. Jeff, I had a golden retriever growing up, and, and that was his thing, is whenever he, somebody would come yeah. to the door or would, you know, I'd come back from being outside or whatever, he'd the tail would wag and he'd run and find a toy and bring it to me because I just thought yeah. because he was a retriever, right? That's what they're bred to do. It calms them. It's really amazing. I, my dog is not a retriever, but she'll pick up her, what we call baby, made by one of our clients. And uh, it was such a sweet thing for her to do when she was a puppy. And that became her toy when she's anxiety. She picks it up and walks around with it. So it's not just retrievers, but it's just, it's a well-known trait in retrievers to pick things up and be contented by that. It's hilarious. It's so, dogs, well, cats too, are so endearing, birds as well. I'm not so sure about goldfish, but there you go. I've never seen a goldfish uh, fish retrieve anything, at least not yet. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I honestly, I love fish, but I don't see the appeal in trying to teach them to retrieve, that's for sure. No, <laughs> two four zero five six thousand is the number. John, welcome to the program. Hey there. Uh, hi, doctor. A uh, question I have is um, I adopted a kitten from Bide a while there about a year and a half ago, and they had uh, him on uh, kibble stuff, right? And um, 
he turned like a year old. And I think I was maybe it could have been you that said that, or somebody was saying that you know cats are meat eaters. So uh, I mean, he wasn't overly excited about the hard stuff, the food. So I started to mix, or well, not mixing in, but I would separately put a bowl of hard food and then separately a bowl of soft food every morning. And I'm just wondering if that's a bad idea. Like he's kind of hit and miss. He'll eat both actually it, on a good day. He'll he'll eat both and eat a good amount of it. Other days he just leaves the soft stuff, and I'm throwing it out all the time uh, without him eating it at all. So it's kind of off and on where he'll eat. He primarily eats the hard stuff, but he dabbles in the soft stuff. So I was wondering if that was a bad idea to have both of those out every morning, the soft and the hard food. Nope, it's a great question. So right away, you got a boy cat. And I'll just say to the listening audience, it's my professional opinion, and some other vets are of the same persuasion, that uh, dry food may not be all that healthy for cats in general and boy cats especially because the more fluid they get into them, the more often they're going to flush their bladders and reduce uh, crystal formation in their urethra. uh, Female cats can have it too, but their anatomy is just uh, different that they don't typically, I'm not going to say never, but they don't typically block. Okay, there's another product out there called HydroCare. It's basically a, if you will, a third bowl that you, uh, you know, open a package, pour, you know, about half the pack in a, a bowl, and that can also make your cat drink more because where I'm going here is you're asking about diet. I'm taking it further and talking about one of the more common ailments in male cats is, is crystal crystals in the urine leading the blockage. Having said that, your question was, you know, should I do this and continue it? Yes. The short answer is yes. A good quality canned cat food by far and above is the better choice over dry. I'm not anti dry food, but uh, I'm not pro it either. If you, as you can tell, and the more, if you will, good quality. There, there's a lot of difference between foods and price isn't always an easy guide. Uh, sorry, isn't an, uh, a guide to use. It doesn't make choices easier. You know, I'm not saying also that you have to feed veterinary food either. I'm just saying that, you know, there is reading a pet food label is something you want to email your vet about and let him or her take the time to give their opinion on it. But long story short, yes, cats should have, and that's what we do in our home, we feed a diet called DH by Purina, which is very effective for dental management, and that's our dry food. And then we use a, a variety of other cans, some of it OM and some of it other diets, that basically help both weight management and hydrate the cats, and with HydroCare as well, because that hydration thing, boy, you know, just for those people who feed dry food out there, boy cats can get very dehydrated fairly easily. And last thing, uh, feed the dry at night. You know, have just put a little handful down before you go to bed and try using canned throughout the day. Um, and that way, with some dry down before you go to bed, the cat shouldn't want to wake you up in the middle of the night to be fed. And there you go. Okay, okay. so just to, just to reiterate, reiterate there, um, so I, I can leave out the dry and the soft, or are you saying just mainly do some soft or uh, hard stuff at night and then mainly do the soft stuff? The latter, mainly do the soft stuff, hard stuff at night, um, more canned than dry, and consider that hydrocare in there too. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, doctor. Thanks, John. 902-405-6000 is the number. That's 902-405-6000. We need to take another break. Jeff, Dr. Jeff is here after the break. You're listening to the Tavino Show. We're back in minutes. Thanks. put a spell on you. Welcome back to a spooky edition of the Tavino Show. This is Ask the Vet. Dr. Jeff Goodall is here to answer your questions. We've got a few minutes left, so we'll try and get to as many as we can, Dr. Jeff. And we'll go right to the phones and welcome Ron to the program. Ron, how are you? I'm not too bad. Thank you very much. Your question, please. Uh, Yes, I have a question for Dr. Jeff. uh, I have a 14-year-old West Holland White Terrier that um, he's over the last year, he's really starting to get, uh, uh, his hearing has been going very, very, uh, very bad. And I'm just wondering if there's uh, anything that might be there or if it could be possibly a wax build up or something or. So boy, that's a tough one, sir. I mean, it's hard to see any pet get elderly. Um, there drop uh, drop an email to your vet. I mean, sensory changes 
you know, you're talking about hearing, but once hearing starts to go, it's usually the last to go, to be honest. Uh, sorry, second last to go after uh, with smell being the last. But right. um, now I'm going to be concerned about, you know, loss of taste. Uh, it is a natural process, but, you know, you don't like it. And, you know, 14 seems a little young. Um, so, no, there's nothing specific for hearing. Uh, the problem, of course, is hearing tests exist for dogs, but they're quite involved. And I believe only the veterinary college does them now. Um, okay. And that's over the top. So something to think about. I mean, there's some evidence that fish oil supplements might help. Uh, it certainly helps eye health, brain health in general. And if we're helping the brain then and joints, it does have it, fish oil do many positive things. And you can just give, uh, oh, you're a tiny little dog. My brain says 600 milligrams. Uh, okay. So you may have to like get a little liver oil type thing? Or? No, I'm talking just like three, six fatty acid fish oil. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I don't like the plug stuff, but I will say Nutrisy and Dartmouth, they make some great products that are very absorbable. Okay. And inexpensive, you can buy them in the, you know, don't buy the lemon flavor, buy mango or uh, apple and put it on his food. Just get a small bottle. They also make a uh, yep. smoky meat flavor that's available at your vet. And, you know, that's going to help slow that senior sensory degradation. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, and then watch for things like disorientation, restlessness, confusion, uh, anxiety, those can be signs of, of cognitive decline. And the sooner you get on top of that with your vet, and let's not forget our arthritic discomfort, uh, yeah. you know, you can actually use diets that have increased fish oils in them. You can use diets that have uh, joint supplementation in it. Um, uh, I won't get into the diet that I tend to recommend here because I don't want to promote one company over another, okay. but there are some cog there are some cognition diets out there too, sir. There you go. Okay. No, I mean, other than that, he's in, he's in very good shape, this dog, you know? Yeah. You got to love Westies, right? The little tails wag and they waddle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah no, he's great. Yep. Give him a hug for me, please. All right. <laughs> good enough. Well, thanks for, thanks very much. Thanks, Ron. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Let's see if we can squeeze one more in here, Dr. Jeff, before we have to, uh, to depart for the yeah, day. I'm watching the time for us, too. Yep. And here is Jack. Jack, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. A uh, five-year-old, year, five year old, a Frenchie, um, Frenchie pug cross, male, um, approximately 30 pounds, and I'm mixing small dog food, the small dog pedigree with the large stuff. Is that okay? Or um, The short answer is sure. I mean, as long as he's eating and you're keeping his weight under control, remember there's a thing called body condition scoring for the audience out there. You can just Google dog body condition score chart, and it talks about there's nine numbers from one to nine. So one is too thin. Nine is too fat. French bulldogs generally are people accept there being seven and eight on on that scale, which is obese. That leads to a Kilograms. lot of problems. These dogs. Uh, Kilograms. Kilograms. Sorry? Seven or eight. Well, you well, said I'm, I'm said. not going to I'm not going to I don't know about weight. I'm just saying in general on that scale mm -hmm. of one to nine, uh, people seem to accept sevens and eights. And bulldogs generally any snub nose face dog is going to have difficulty breathing as time goes on and uh, temperature management. So keep your dog lean. And in the end, that diet mix is just fine. That's the crux of your question. Um, but just make sure you adjust the amount to make those ribs feel like running your fingers across the knuckles of the, your, of the back of your hand. And there you go. Yeah, and I also sometimes I'll mix in, like a, once in a while, I'll mix in the Caesars in with the hard stuff, or I'll do the canned pedigree. So it's probably okay. Yeah, I'm not big fans of those diets, but that, that's good. You go right ahead. Okay, thank you very much for your input. Thanks, Jack. And uh, Dr. Jeff, that's going to do it for us for another week. Have oh, a have a have a morning. happy happy Halloween, and uh, make sure that uh, all of your fur animals and stuff at home are all dressed up tonight. Yes, so let's be kind to each other and to our pets, please. Take Thanks. care, guys. Thanks, Dr. Thanks Jeff. Thanks everybody. Bye. That is Dr. Jeff Goodall. He's here once a month on the uh, the last Thursday of the month to answer your pet-related questions and uh, makes you feel better, doesn't it? I miss my dogs. I do. I don't have, I'm not able to have them anymore. So uh, in the place that I live, 
but uh, they uh, they are certainly uh, is a hole in the life when you don't have your animals and and I feel for the for the folks with the older ones because that's not fun to watch. But uh, I'll tell you a funny story and I was waiting till after Dr. Jeff was off the line because he probably would have yelled at me. But my grandmother was a big fan of West Highland Terriers. She had Westies from the time I can remember until she passed and and uh, on it was a tradition. <laughs> A tradition, that's why I waited for the vet, on, at my family to go to visit on Sundays. And my grandmother would always have a great big pot of spaghetti on the stove because my uh, my mom had uh, five brothers and sisters and we all had you know, tons of cousins. So she'd just make a massive big pot of this stuff, right? And and we'd just go there. It was kind of self-serving and, and, and so on and so forth. And But the Westies, for whatever reason, would uh, would get the plates or the bowls after... We were done eating, and uh, you can imagine uh, West Highland Terrier, for those that aren't familiar, are pure white, including in the face, and Grandma's spaghetti sauce was traditional spaghetti sauce, so they had uh, red faces probably for the week leading up to the next time that we had spaghetti. I miss those dogs tremendously. They were fun. Hope you're having, uh, uh, we'll have a fantastic Halloween. Thank you very much to Vanessa Vanden as on the other side of the glass. Remember the trick or treaters and the ghouls and the goblins and the, the Spider-Mans and Supermans and Batmans and everything else will be out on those streets tonight, particularly on your drive home. So be cautious out there today. Take a little extra time. Keep an eye out for the trick or treaters so we don't have any tragedies and everybody have a little bit of fun uh, tonight because uh, it's one of these these times of the year when we can have a little bit of fun. We've got a big show planned for you tomorrow. Cecil will be here to talk a little bit about the World Series and uh, to set up the weekend worth of sports. Vanessa's being coy, but she says she may have another set of tickets available to give away tomorrow for Sunday's game at the Scotiabank Centre, so make sure that you listen for that. Tim Powers will be here. I heard him cheating on us with Rob Snow earlier this week. We'll have to scold him for that. Anyway, Tim will be here to talk politics and we'll also, uh, uh, due to caller demand, we managed to reach out to Mark Brewer, our friend in Maine, the political scientist there, and uh, we'll, we'll tee up the upcoming United States election. Lots to talk about tomorrow. Hope you can join us. Thanks again to Vanessa for everything she does. Thanks to you for dialing the numbers and joining the show. Remember, stay out of trouble and be kind to one another.